Now I'm going to try to prove L'Hopital's rule to you, and I'm going to do it by looking at these two functions. f of x is x squared plus 3x minus 4, and g of x is the natural log of x. And we're going to try to find the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x over g of x. And you might recognize this example. This was the first example we looked at. We opened our discussion of L'Hopital's rule with this problem. What I'm going to do now is graph these two functions, and we'll look at the graph near x equals 1. But I will very quickly generalize this to show that it works in general, not just with this specific example. So let's think about the graphs here. If here's the x-axis, function f is a quadratic, a parabola that opens upward, and function g is the natural log function, and it just so happens that both of these functions cross the x-axis right here, right there at x equals 1. So right there, both functions have a y value of 0, and that's what makes this an indeterminate form. If we try to calculate this, we're calculating 0 over 0. Let's take a look at those two graphs real quick on the calculator. I've got y1 here, x squared plus 3x minus 4, that's function f, and the natural log function g in for y2. And I'm going to graph this. I'll start with the standard zoom settings. And so there's the quadratic, and there's the natural log function. And they both cross the axis right there at x equals 1, but that's kind of hard to see right there. So let's zoom in. I'll hit zoom and zoom in. And then you need to put the cursor near that point, and it'll zoom in on that point. So put the cursor there and press enter. And it zooms in with uh, that point near the middle of the screen. So there's the quadratic and the natural log. I'm going to zoom in again at the same point. So hit zoom and zoom in and put the cursor near uh, x equals 1 and press enter. And there's the quadratic and there's the natural log function. Now notice as I zoom in the graphs appear more and more straight and that's important here. Now, this is a phenomenon that we see, we've seen before. We call it local linearity. If you zoom in on a small section of the graph it appears very straight just like zooming in on a small section of the Earth, we consider it flat. I don't worry about the curvature of the Earth when I'm thinking about the floor of this room. And you can always zoom in on these graphs far enough that they appear straight. Let's zoom in one more time. So zoom in on that same point, and there's the quadratic, and there's the natural log function. And they appear very straight in that diagram. Okay, so back to this. I'm going to redraw this diagram zoomed in at that point. So let's erase this and draw this. So here's the x-axis and then function f, something like that, and function g, something like that. So this is f of x and this is g of x. Now both of these functions cross the axis right here at x equals 1 but this could be this could be true in general this could be any point as long as they both cross the axis at that point so I'm going to call this x equals c and c is just some number where both of those graphs have a y value of 0 and then you can see on the graphs that near x equals c both of these functions f and g have y values that aren't 0 so if I come over here to the right of point C, I have a certain y value here for function f, and I'll have a certain y value here for function g. And I don't want to call both of those y, so I'm just going to call them f and g for those two y values. And we want to think about the ratio of those y values, f over g. And you can probably see that that ratio will be the same across the x values in this diagram. So f over g right there will be the same ratio as f over g right here, or f over g right there, all the way over to that point. Or you could also think about starting right here at x equals c and moving to the right. 
And as you move to the right, function f goes up and function g goes up, but they go up at different rates. So as we move along these lines, how high function f is compared to g depends on the slopes of those functions. And that's really the whole thing right there. It is the slopes of these lines that matter right here. The slopes of the functions will determine the value of the ratio of f over g near that point. And that's going to be true as long as those functions both cross the axis right there at x equals c, and as long as they're both straight. And, and they are straight in this diagram because we're zoomed in. And if they're not straight enough for you, just keep zooming in. They will be perfectly straight once we are zoomed in infinitely far. And if we're zoomed in infinitely far, we don't think of these y values as f and g. We would think of them as little infinitely small quantities, which we would call df and dg. So let's write that df is this y value here, and dg is this y value there. So you can see on this diagram that close to this point x equals c, the ratio of those two functions in the notation of differential quantities is df over dg. So we can write this. We can write near x equals c, the ratio of those two functions, f of x over g of x, is equal to this df, this y value, over this y value, is equal to df over dg. Now the next step here is really simple. This is just a little fraction here, df over dg. And we know that we can take a fraction and divide the numerator and the denominator by the same quantity. So I'm going to take the numerator and divide it by dx and take the denominator and divide it by dx. And look at that. Look what we have here. In the numerator, we have df over dx. That's just df dx. That's the derivative of function f at point c. And in the denominator, we have dg dx, and that's the derivative of function g at point c. And if you want to see what dx is in the diagram, just remember what df over dx is. This is df, and this is dx. And so df over dx is a rise over a run. That's the slope of function f right there. And dg dx is a rise over a run. So those are slopes rise over run, and that's what we mean by the derivative at that point. So I'll just complete the diagram by drawing in this segment right here and calling it dx. And, and so that's it. Near x equals c, the ratio of those two functions is the ratio of the derivative of function f at that point to the derivative of function g at that point. So we can write, we can write it like this. I'll come down here and I'll say, therefore, The limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x is equal to f prime of c over g prime of c. And I like that graphical approach to demonstrating this because as far as we know, that is what Bernoulli had in mind when he wrote this down and explained it to L'Hopital. Now, Bernoulli wasn't necessarily thinking in terms of limits. Remember, the theory of limits wasn't developed until 100 or 150 years later. This was 1696 that L'Hopital's textbook was published. And the theory of limits with Weierstrass wasn't worked out until uh, a century or more after that. But the notation that Leibniz had come up with, with the differential quantities, these infinitesimal quantities, dx and dy, that was in use at the time. And as far as I know, diagrams similar to this appear in Bernoulli's work with an understanding of local linearity.
Now, a couple of other things that can be seen while we have this diagram here uh, that are worth mentioning. One is these functions both have to be differenti differentiable at this point. So we're thinking about the slope of function f and the slope of function g through those points, and applying L'Hopital's rule involves calculating those slopes, which we couldn't do if we couldn't draw these straight lines zoomed in right there. So f and g both have to be different, differentiable for L'Hopital's rule to apply. Also, as we see in this diagram, they both have to have a zero value at that point for L'Hopital's rule to apply. So this, this little proof I've given you shows that it works for the indeterminate form 0 over 0. Now it also works for other indeterminate forms, but what we see here is the two functions have to have a value of 0 at that point, because this ratio uh, f over g, which we see in these little quantities right here, f over g, that ratio would not be the same all the way over to this point unless these two lines were converging uh, in, a, in a linear fashion at that point. So what we've shown is that this applies if f and g both have a value of 0 at that point. But it's not that hard to get from the 0 over 0 case to the infinity over infinity case. And um, I'll do this algebraically because it's really pretty simple. So suppose we have the limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x. And suppose as we get close to an x value of c, function f approaches infinity and function g also approaches infinity. So this is an indeterminate form, infinity over infinity. But it's uh, almost trivial to transform this into the 0 over 0 case. Um, remember, the reciprocal of something infinitely large is something infinitely small. So what I'm going to do is rewrite this like this. I'm going to say the limit as x approaches c of 1 over g of x over 1 over f of x. And this is algebraically equivalent. You can see that uh, 1 over function g right there is equivalent to having function g in the denominator. And down here, 1 over f is equivalent to having f in the numerator. And if function g is growing infinitely large near x equals c, then 1 over g is getting infinitely small. So that's approaching a value of 0. And the same thing with function f. If f is getting huge, then 1 over f is getting infinitely small. And we have seen that L'Hopital's rule applies in this case. Therefore, it must also apply in this case, which is algebraically equivalent. We can't necessarily make a succinct little explanation with a diagram if these quantities are infinitely large. But it applies for the infinity over infinity case as well as 0 over 0.